G'day, this is Andy from Melody. Today we've got a little something different for you, something special, in fact. I'm going to talk to my friend Marcus Darcy. Um, Marcus is uh, an editor with 40 years experience from um, cinema, TV, um, the gamut of styles, drama, comedy, documentary. Um, he's uh, an Academy Award nominee. He's a BAFTA nominee. He's won a Film Critics of Australia Award. He's worked on... Um, some seminal Australian uh, uh, movies and TV series, Bangkok Hilton, Dead Calm, um, Mad Max, Babe, Dark City, The Year My Voice Broke, Last Kept at Darwin, Lyrans as well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he's also worked on some other classics like Oddball, um, Rams, and a, even a, a horror creature flick, uh, Anaconda. Um, but what this guy doesn't know about editing isn't worth knowing. So um, I'm really happy to be able to bring this to you and, and I hope you'll get something from it. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Marcus Darcy. Uh, mate, thank you so much for today. I really appreciate you uh, taking a bit of time to talk to uh, both to me and to our extended sort of Melody family, <clears throat> because um, you know, you've obviously got a, 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 an incredible cache of work, um, a breadth of work as well um you know um and maybe that's a good place to start because you've done i mean currently you're in the middle of a uh, a documentary you've done dramatic stuff you've done comedy um you've done tv you've done film so do you approach um these different styles and these different um uh, mediums in a in a different fashion or do you kind of always start with the same premise the same premise i start with because editing is the same no matter what the content or what the footage is. You are still taking um, a, a series of shots and putting them in an order that will tell the story. It's basically storytelling, whether it's funny storytelling or serious storytelling, it's all storytelling. So the narrative arc is kind of the most important thing for you. Yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. And, and that's, what, that's generally what uh, will um, bring me to a project. If I, if I s s read a story that really excites me then I, and I want to help be a part of telling it, that will, you know, very much dictate whether I say yes or no. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, obviously, the um, when you're working in a documentary, you 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 you're currently like you are currently. You're trying to deal with a set of facts um, that are not necessarily malleable, um, and um, but they may change. And, and I know in this project that you're working on, that's sort of evolved as the project's gone on, hasn't it? So well, documentary is a completely different kettle of fish to drama. Documentaries, you shoot it first and then you write the script, as opposed to writing the script and then shooting it as you would in a drama. Yeah, right, 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 right. So you go, you know, they certainly go out there with an idea, but uh, documentaries can change in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat, yeah. While they're shooting, particularly. <laughs> God, what a nightmare! Happen. What a nightmare if you're shooting. Um, on that no, point, no, not really. It, it makes it more interesting because then you have to then figure out a way to pull the footage together and then write the script, i.e. the narration, that uh, tells the story that happened while you were shooting. On, on that point, I mean, um, obviously you're probably coming to a project by seeing the script first um, yep. um, or at least a treatment in the instance of a documentary. Um, are you ever, uh, do you ever get into a project at the point where you need to go on set? Is it, and is there any value in you being on set? Um, yeah, I go on set all the time. In fact, I get called on set quite often where if, if I'm cutting while they're shooting. And the, the benefit of cutting while you're shooting is that you can be feeding back to the crew or the, the director or the producers that, uh, yes, we've got everything we need for that scene. I can, I can cut that scene in a number of ways now and I, you don't have to do any pickups. But if, if I spot something that's missing, I'll put the flag up straight away and quite often I'll go out to set with a cut on a, as a quick time or something like that and show the director what's what's how it's going or how it's not going. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> and, what, right. and that gives you the opportunity. You've got the actors, you've got the cameras, you've got the sets. They can do your pickup to solve the problem. On the spot. On, well, well, yeah. You still potentially. Got a schedule with it. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. And quite um, often it's just little pickups of close-ups of um things that are happening in the story that just help tell it because you can see it better sure sure that you wouldn't have that you wouldn't know otherwise if you weren't there yeah yeah good one you know and if i think if i see uh, an actor pick something up and look at it i want to know what he's looking at 
So if they don't get me a close up of that, then I'll so I'll put it on the pickups list and say, can you know? Any, then anybody can pick it up, you know, put a camera on it. Can be anybody's hand, sort yeah. of thing. You know, so that a lot of the pickups can be very simple and very easy to schedule and shoot. Yeah, sure. But they're a real help to you, obviously, when it comes time to putting things together. Yeah. And, you know, most first eight Ds will sort of quake in their boots when I walk on set <laughs> because they think, oh, no, the, the fucking editor's here. Yeah. There goes, they're blocking <laughs> out the window. The good ones will look at me and go, do we need something? I'll, I'll you know, go and have a talk to them. Yeah, sure. And, so, yeah, need, and see, they're the best ones to talk to because they, they've they got a big picture of what's going on set all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So they can say, well, well, that camera's free now. Grab it and go over there and shoot it. So quite often I'll go on set and grab a camera assistant and get the shot I'm looking for. Yeah, good one, good one. That's good to know. Mm. Um, TV um, and film are obviously very different mediums, although they seem to be getting closer and closer with the advent of Netflix and Amazon Prime, et cetera, and the stands yeah. of the world. Um I mean, obviously, with episodic TV, that's a different uh, kettle of fish, isn't it? Because you have, in fact, some characters that go from episode to episode, but then some storylines that need to resolve within the context of 30 or 60 minutes. So um, is that a challenge, uh, trying to keep the, the longer storyline going with the incidental or the immediate Not really one? A challenge because it's, it's the writer's responsibility to, to keep the, the story arcs alive. Um, you know, I can only cut the material I'm given, if you know what I mean by that. Yeah. But um, television is a different ball game in the sense that it's, you know they don't want it good; they want it Wednesday. So right. it's fast and furious. Uh, I I refer to it as a young person's game these days because now that I've hit sixty years old, um, I'm not cut out for television anymore. Although I, I wouldn't say you know big budget TV where there's a bit more room to move and time to, to play. I could do that, but not this really high-speed stuff that they do these days. It's it's astonishingly fast. Yeah, right. Um, like I said, they don't want, they don't want it good. They want it Wednesday. Yeah, sure, sure. My, my, as an audio and music person, I, I know that argument because <laughs> generally we're at the tail end of the cycle, you know, and then when they've run out of time and and running out of money potentially. Um, yeah. Well, as I say to all sound people, you chose to be at that end of the food chain. <laughs> Yeah, try turning the volume down, Marcus. That's all I'm saying. Um, okay. <laughs> um, um, have you? Uh, do you find technology? And you and I are of a vintage that we've both, but have been on a cusp and straddled the line between <clears throat> Steambacks and, yeah. and Avid's and Setmag and Digitus in you know Avid and um, and um, Pro Tools. Are you, are you use sticky tape to join pieces of celluloid together. <laughs> It seems now I, now, ridiculous. Now I click the mouse. <laughs> yeah, it seems ridiculous. I've still got scars on my fingers from razor blading. Uh, multi oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, do you think it's been a, I mean, obviously, you know, it, it provides you with possibilities, with technology, but do you think it, there are hindrances with it as well? Um, with the modern technology, there's not a lot of think time. When you're going through the laborious process of, a, you know, the, the guillotine splicer and the, the sticky tape and, you know, all of that stuff that happened, the, the physical labour that went on, you had a lot of time to think about what you're doing. So you tend to be much more precise with where you cut the film. These days, because you're working in a digital field, um, you, can, you can put things together much quicker and you can do versions of it much quicker. But then that leads to another problem called version help. <laughs> <laughs> too many options too many options yeah, yeah. whereas on, in the good old film days yes it was labor intensive and i wouldn't go back to that for any money in the world but um you tended to be much more uh precise before you put a you know put the scissors through the piece of film yeah interestingly on, on that now we've got a couple of composers in the library who i know like to make decisions like force themselves into a corner by recording things, <laughs> by recording the things that they can't alter after the fact, you know, so that way that decision's made, and you can't go back to it. Um, Marty Haley and Dave Goodison, who are both amazing guitar players, you know, record their amplifiers. Where it's so easy these days to record a clean guitar and then modify it down the track. So that kind of right. cuts that, you know, cuts that yeah. that versionitis out out of the you know out of the way to a degree because it's there's nothing you can do about it. So yeah. Um, um, we spoke about this a little bit earlier um, in terms of uh, music um, uh, decisions as to when a scene needs music and when within a scene 
uh, you should start and finish music. Maybe you could explain that to people from a cinematic point of view. Well, um, that's a very good question because quite often you want to start the music, the scene before where you want the music to be. So you've got some time for it to sit underneath everything else and just build up to where you're headed with it. So you're leading um, a change in effect. Yeah, kind of. You're sort of saying to the audience, um, pay attention, there's something coming. It, not really, but you know what I mean. It's a, yep. you know, once music starts, they go, oh, wait a minute, it's, you know, it's about to get interesting. It's interesting. It's subconscious uh, stuff, isn't it, you know, that? Yeah, absolutely. Music. And, and it's very subtle because music can be held very, very low Yeah. and the audience is not even aware that it's there. And then when you want to really push it, you, you bring up the volume in the mix. Um, and like I was saying a bit before, um, I tend to um, not bring music into my cut until the cut is very advanced because then by the time you've got your cut very advanced, you've kind of got your internal rhythms of the scene working and then more, nine times out of ten, music just falls into place because you've already got a rhythm going on. And it never ceases to amaze me how often I'll, and it can be any piece of music, whether it's Hans Zimmer or just a temp that the, the composer did for the, the director in the early days, because um, music is all rhythmical. I don't need to tell you that, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if you get your cutting rhythms correct, um, and I can't, I don't know if I could ever explain how, what I mean by getting your cutting rhythms correct. It's just a feeling. It's an instinct that, you know, you feel like, yeah, that's the right time to go to the next shot. Uh, yeah, and right. sometimes... It can. It doesn't have to be when that other when the, the actor finishes saying what he's saying because you might want to put half the line over onto the next person so you can see the impact of that line on that person. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, it's it. it every scene is has to be approached uh, as a unique piece. Yeah. And yeah. you look at the material you've got and you figure out the best way to put it together. And then I I leave music out of it for a very long time because um, I don't want the music to be driving the cut. Yeah. Or the cut driving music. Yeah, that's interesting. And as we were discussing before, and a, you know, a lot of people who um, you know who are part of the kind of greater melody family work in uh, you know different fields, whereby they might actually go to the track first, and the track might, yeah. and you know, once they they go to the track, is that's exactly the mood I'm looking for. Now I need to find the shots to make it work, or I need to yeah. um, you know adjust my edit around the track to make it to you know because the it, the music's already doing the most of the heavy lifting for me, so. Yeah. How can I make it that's, work? That's yeah. more often the case in um, uh, commercials, I think. Yeah, for sure. I've, I've seen editors lay down tracks and then, you know, drop shots in on top of the audio to, to get it to work. That's, and that's a fine. There's nothing wrong with working that way. If the music is doing the heavy listing, by all means. Yeah. When you are doing these um, uh, temp music um, edits, um, what typically are you asking the music to do i mean my my whole reason virtual with music for what we do in melody is that we're, we're it's the feels the music is from my perspective is that we're trying to get into the library is about making you feel something with is that would that be an accurate way of describing what you're doing with it as well that's a very accurate way to do it the only problem we have there is that we tend to reach for um you know impossible dreams like uh, hans zimmer and you know a, a 160 piece LA Philharmonic Orchestra. And you know, you use that as temp music, everyone falls in love with it. And then the, the composer comes along and he doesn't stand a chance. Sure. There, <laughs> and, there, you know, hey. There are multiple ways of making you feel, you know, you can do it with a, an acoustic guitar as much as you can with an 160 sure. bit orchestra if it's, you know, if it's well crafted and put together. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, um, have you ever gone through a whole day or maybe even a whole week and got to the end of it going, this is not working, I'm just going to chuck it out and start again? Or do you always go back and just kind of refine what you've got? I would never go for a whole week. If it's not working, it tends to present itself pretty early and you, you'll know, oh, no, that's the wrong way to go with this. Let's go back to the beginning and start again. But, yeah, I do I do toss stuff out. I keep it because you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it, I just put it aside because quite often you go back to the original idea you started with before you got cut yourself into a corner <laughs> and you realise that there is a good idea in there and with a bit of hindsight and, and time, you can see a way through to using reintroducing the idea into the cut. But yeah. that's, that's one of those things. Sometimes in the 
when you're assembling a film, you're under a lot of pressure to get every day's filming assembled as quickly as you can so you can give them, you know, you can't let it pile up in the back room yeah, sure. sort of thing. You've got to stay on top of things and stay at what, what the expression is, stay behind the camera. So yeah, that right. you are literally, if they shot something on a Wednesday, you get it on a Thursday morning, um, your assistants processed it by Thursday lunchtime, by Thursday afternoon you've got a cut or a, an assembly, not necessarily the cut, but an sure. assembly. Sure. Um, and so that uh, that's really, um, you know, uh, that, it, the pressure of that <clears throat> can tend to lead you to go down pathways you don't really want to go down. Yeah. However, um, like I said, you, you always keep those things in a bin somewhere because you go back and say, well, what was I trying to do here? And then you re remember what you're trying to do and then you've got the benefit of hindsight and possibly not the pressure of the shoot and so you can you can sh show it to the director and say, look, I was trying to do this and it just didn't work so I threw it away. And he might bounce off that with another idea or you might have another idea. I mean, every idea is, is kind of worth um, something. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> no, no, I totally hear you. Um, and maybe this just a little bit of uh, insight for people who are perhaps at a different, you know, end of their career that, you know, when you're doing these assembly edits in the, while they're shooting, they're obviously not shooting the in sequential order. They're shooting, you know, whatever they're getting yeah. from that location on that day. So you're doing an assembly that has massive holes in it right from the Absolutely. beginning. And you might start at the, you know, at the three quarter mark and then go back to day two. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Hey, um, while you speaking about directors there, I wonder what, um, you know, do you think that you've picked up things from directors in terms of your approach as an editor? Um, um, and in fact, other editors, have you learned things from other editors? Well, the truth is I've never actually sat in a room with another editor while they're working. It, that, that doesn't tend to happen, but I have picked up a great deal from a few of the directors I've worked with over the years. George Miller's a classic example. He was all about rhythm, you know, and he said there's two kinds of rhythm. There's the rhythm of the footage, and there's the rhythm of the information. Um, and so, you know, and he was painstaking about getting the rhythm right. So I learned to, you know, I've, I've become a bit painstaking myself. <laughs> no, that, look, the thing is some directors will drive you absolutely nuts because they just, you think they're just fiddling around, they've got no clue what they're doing. I'm very cautious about ever calling anybody out on that because you never, you just never know if they, what they're trying to achieve and until you, you've got to get into their head and see if you can figure it out. And sometimes, um, another example of, of a piece of genius that nobody wanted to recognise at first is in the Babe movie, which uh, George didn't direct, but he was a producer on. Um, when we were in the cutting room, he said, what's the extension on that shot of that pig? And we just looked at him and said, oh, George, it's, the pig just lifts its head for its food reward. And, you know, so the pig lifts its head, meow, 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 meow. And, and, and lo and behold, George says, it's singing. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Exactly. So that is now the most memorable piece of the film. Wow. The, the, That's the singing pig. And we're all going, George, you must be nuts. The pig's just looking for food. But, you know, he it just he's got a different eye. To, mm. And the rest of us are really close up at the coalface. George was sitting back a little bit. So, you know, you, you've got to keep your eyes and ears open to other suggestions. Even if the cleaner walks in the room and says something, I always, to, you know, and I learned this from George too, I always turn around and say, what, say that again? You know, explain that to me so that I understand where, where he's coming from. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can't That's discount great. anybody's ideas. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. Anyway, it's good to be open, mm. isn't it, to get part oh, yeah. of you? Everything yeah, I mean, ultimately, you and the director are going to make the decision that, as to what goes in the film, but there's no harm in listening to another idea from somebody who's not even connected to directing or editing sometimes. Sometimes they've got the clearest view. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, now, if you were tomorrow uh, born again and you were starting your career as a, 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 um, a junior in the industry, yeah. How do you how do you think you'd approach it? What what would you do? Where would you be looking to go? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm I'm not really in touch with how it all works these days because I basically I got very lucky when I started and, and I sort of uh, caught on to some uh, one of the girls I went to school with. Her father was a director at the ABC, so he got me in to see the bloke who hired and fired at the ABC in the in the post production department, and he must have said a very good word about me because I, three months later I had a job. Um. 
But these days, youngsters come out of the womb with a mouse in one hand and a tablet in the other. <laughs> you know, they're, they're very digitally savvy. In fact, so much so that I can't operate in the modern age in my job without a very tuned in, digitally savvy assistant. Um, because what they don't know, they know how to find out. They just, if they don't know how something works, they Google it <laughs> and it's all there. You know, and it just never ceases to amaze me the ingenuity of some of these youngsters coming up. Um, but what I would say to the young people is find a hole, find a gap somewhere and go and offer yourself for nothing for a limited period of time just so you can get in and learn and, um, you know, don't don't let yourself be exploited, but, you know, offer yourself up. If you're worth your weight, um, then you'll hopefully become, you know, quite, quite indispensable to the team. And they'll say, right, you're doing a good, you're doing good work. You can come on the team. It's good advice. So certainly, I've got a, a, a youngster in the neighbourhood who's who's now found himself as an uh, assistant um, DOP or a clapper oh, yeah. probably. You know, um, yeah. but really, really was just you know being the first guy on set and the last guy to leave. Yeah. In the, in the shittiest <laughs> jobs, and everyone kept going. He's still here. <laughs> well, that's know, the thing. So I mean, those who do the shitty jobs well get remembered. Yeah, all right, and that's what I said to him. I said, just keep doing it, mate, because um, yeah. they won't forget you. That's exactly right. And, you know, there are a bunch of shitty jobs at the bottom end of post, and, and as there are at the bottom end of the, the camera department. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're tedious and shitty, and if you, if you make a mistake, it comes back to haunt you and, um, you know, you just – those people who do the shitty jobs will get remembered. Yeah, I think particularly if you're a problem solver as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you can... So there is a mindset that helps if you're one of those people. Yeah, absolutely. Mate, thank you so much for today. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been great to have the insights of someone who's got so much knowledge and um, and uh, next time we see each other, hopefully we'll have a glass of red wine in our hands. Oh, good idea. We should have had done that now, but it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's only 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs>